Thank you, Naomi. Thank you all for being here. What a great crowd. If, if I saw this many of my own faculty in one room, I would be in trouble, I know. <laughs> it would not be a happy moment. For, don't tell, you, that, this isn't being recorded, is it? Uh, so here we go. So uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I don't, you've all been working uh, in sessions and, 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 and um, focused on important things in teaching and learning. Uh, I, I think we all agree on a few things probably, but one thing we would all agree on, I believe, I'm just going to take this out of my, away from the microphone, is that uh, freedom of expression uh, is uh, vital for any serious form of education. To be able to speak without fear, to be able to write, to be able to draw without fear, to be able to um, try out ideas that will piss people off, that will amuse them, that will frustrate them, that will offend them. And uh, while you were working, I was glued to my television set this morning. Uh, the um, Alleged uh, killers of the journalists have uh, at uh, Charlie Hebdo have been uh, killed. Uh, four hostages have also been killed this morning in, in Paris uh, uh, and uh, other uh, suspected assailants. I feel like I could just not talk about the history of uh, liberal education, but instead talk about what issues this raises for us. I wrote a, a, you know, a blog like many of you um, uh, tweet or blog, and uh, I, I put up a, 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 a picture of myself uh, with a Je suis Charlie uh, uh, piece of paper the other day. Uh, and one of my esteemed uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Emeritus, wrote in to my blog this morning, said, uh, Roth, why don't you go out and say that these were Islamic extremists who killed people? You're a coward. And I thought, there we have it. So many issues in liberal education raised by, I think, the hatred he expresses in his writings more generally and in his comment on my blog more specifically. Um, and in the questions of what counts as audacity for presidents, well, that's a low bar, but for faculty, <laughs> for faculty, for, uh, for us teachers. And so what do I do? I post his comment, because I don't have to. Because what else would I do, having said that what I said when I started? Even though I find that comment hateful, I post it. And now I will receive sponsors saying, you've posted something that's hateful. So many of the issues we grapple with, when we grapple with serious things in education, and God knows I hope we do, are right in this moment here. Uh, but I'm a historian, and although I could sit and talk with you about this moment here, I probably don't know as much as many of you about it. So instead, I'll talk about my book, about which I know more than any of you. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps Naomi uh, is the exception, because she's read it more recently than I. Um, um, uh, and, and so I wanted to talk to you uh, about the history of the commitment to liberal education in the United States. Uh, and and uh, I think, in a way, that will be connected to what we're living right now. Because, because if, if liberal education isn't connected to the way we're living now, it deserves to die. I, I, really, I really believe that. I, I don't think we should do this uh, uh, merely out of antiquarian interest. My, my uh, teacher as an undergraduate was Hayden White at Wesleyan. And uh, antiquarianism was something we talked about through the prism of Nietzsche. It's not something you value uh, uh, except for the pleasure it might give you the fetishistic pleasure, he would have said, um, uh, in the present. I believe liberal education is relevant to these issues in the present. And I think it's more relevant now than it's ever been. And I'll tell you a little bit why. So there are four moments in uh, my story. They go under the words liberate, animate, cooperate, and instigate. I was very proud of myself. I was sitting in front of an audience in Beijing when I uh, came up with that rubric. Of four, and I was very surprised. I thought there'd be 27 people there. There were not as many as you, but there were a few hundred people who came to hear a talk on liberal education. So I thought I'd come up with some 
the other way of slicing it up. And you know, I thought it was, I sound like a kind of hip American as I was rhyming. My translator was less amused. <laughs> Um, but the audience was even less amused because, of course, it didn't rhyme in Chinese at all. Um, as she pointed out to me, only after the talk did I realize that this was an unnecessary affectation on my part. Uh, liberate. I'll start off with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, is the, the figure I spent some time uh, on uh, in Beyond the University because he represents a commitment to education as a path of inquiry that allows you to make choices upon graduation, let's say from a college, rather than education as a procedure that directs you to what you already know is going to happen. The latter is what he associated in his time with Harvard. And Jefferson's commitment, as has been the commitment of so many uh, great educators in this country over the last few hundred years, his commitment was just don't be like Harvard. Right? And so he, in creating the University of Virginia, really thought it was key that students determined their lives after graduation on the basis of the questions they asked rather than on the basis of the choice they made before they asked the questions. And that's, of course, relevant to all of us today in colleges and universities when students come and say, I want to be X. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm majoring in business. Right? Now, that's, that's actually a brave thing to do today. Anybody here from the business school? <laughs> yeah, that's a, brave, that's a brave thing to do because everybody in business says, what, are you crazy going to college for business? You shouldn't go to college for business. Why are you going to college? You should go to, you should go to San Francisco <laughs> or Detroit or to Boston. You should go someplace where you can hatch your own idea. Get a better pizza more quickly. Find a better driver than the Uber drivers. Do something really that will be an example of your own creativity. You don't need anybody else to tell you what they did if you're going into business. So many people say today, you don't belong in school because you already know what you want to do. The Jeffersonian view, the view under the rubric of liberation is you go to school to find out that you don't know yet what you are going to do, and you will discover that bits and pieces through the educational process itself. In other words, education isn't what you choose to fulfill a destiny or your parents' destiny. Education is something you pursue in order to open up possibilities, choices for you in the future. Jefferson wrote to Adams, uh, uh, his friend of me, I guess my daughter tells me I should say, um, um, uh, uh, that ours will be the follies of enthusiasm, not bigotry. We're not here to indoctrinate. We are here to liberate the mind, self-reliance and autonomy. Now here I am in Washington, D.C. at a very progressive school, I'm told, American University. I'm told that uh, um, uh, that when, when people talk about politics here in the classroom, um, they mostly are talking about uh, the, um, the, the, the failures of the Obama administration to live up to its potential um, and, and things to the left of that. that. That was a joke, so I'm glad some of you are laughing. Some of you are like, yeah, what's wrong with that? Uh. <laughs> and so when I talk about Thomas Jefferson, that first thing you think of is probably not liberate and enlightenment and self-reliance. You think of Sally Hemings, you think of racism, you think of slavery, as well you should. What was fascinating to me about um, uh, Jefferson's views on education, uh, and I urge you to read the book. <laughs> My mother told me to do that. Uh, uh, is that those ideas are taken up in short order by the very people who Jeff to, to whom Jefferson denied the benefits of this kind of education. So uh, I was very interested to, to uh, write about David Walker, a free black who lived in New England and who wrote a pamphlet urging his uh, fellow uh, black slaves and free blacks in uh, the North to throw off the yoke of slavery, to rebel against their masters, to do that 
with violence, but also with and through education. And so for David Walker, freedom came through liberation, the liberation of education. So he writes against Jefferson, but he writes in this Jeffersonian mode. And I'm going to read you a quote. I, I brought this up here just so I, I, I wouldn't have to paraphrase David Walker in 1829. Are we not men, he wrote. We are, because we can learn. Right, just right out of the Enlightenment and, and right out of Jefferson. I pray that the Lord may undeceive my ignorant brethren, David Walker wrote in his appeal, and permit them to throw away pretensions and seek after the substance of learning. And here, as a professor, this warms my heart. He says, I would crawl on my hands and knees through mud and mire to the feet of a learned man where I would sit and humbly supplicate him to instill into me that which neither devils nor tyrants could remove, only with my life. For colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. 1829, for colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. The bare name of educating the colored people scares our cruel oppressors almost to death. Yeah. Yeah, still. I think that a lot of this rhetoric about why are you in school? You're from an underrepresented group. Why are you in school? Uh, you're a, a girl. You don't deserve school. Why are you in school? You have a different path. I think a lot of this rhetoric is about trying to keep people from thinking because when people think, they challenge the status quo. And David Walker, when he made that appeal, for which his, he, you know, his, it was a price was put on his head. Uh, uh, in in uh, Alabama, they said, uh, we, you know, dead or alive, we'd prefer him alive so we can torture him to death. He, 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 he was felled by tuberculosis, not by the uh, southern aristocracy. But for David Walker, and for I think so many of our students today, here and around the world, education is connection, connected to liberation. My second beat, second moment, animate. I have to be quick, I know, because I, I promise to leave you time for questions. But uh, animate, I have to say a word about Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, because it's just so much fun to talk about the, uh, the sage of Concord, that to talk about his critique of educational institutions. So Emerson, um, again, Harvard, <laughs> he goes up to Harvard to talk to them. And, and you know, his basic message is, get the hell out of school. You should not be in school, because school is indoctrination. And what it's indoctrinating you into is a pattern of subservience. What you are learning to do is to feel less and to think more narrowly. That's what school's about. Emerson said, no to that form of education. And what kind of education did he have in mind? An education that would make the world more alive for you. And what he said is, uh, maybe I have it, maybe I have it, um, um, yeah. Education is setting souls aflame. I'll give you another quote. Um, uh, colleges say, serve us when they aim not to drill but to create, aim not to drill, but to create. Tell that to your assessors when they come to assess you and your learning goals. I know I'm supposed to like these things. <laughs> How do you assess the ability of a student to make the world more alive? It'd be a good, it's a good question. I don't think it's impossible to answer. But for Emerson, liberal education was about seeing things in the world to which you were blind before, hearing music that you, used to be just noise for you. Seeing creativity where you only saw perversion or idiosyncrasy. What Emerson meant by animation was opening up one's intellectual and cultural horizons so that the world is more alive for you because you have made the world more alive. We, we've all, I trust, we've all had students for whom this has happened. And we see it in our classrooms, whatever you're teaching. Students who were just not able to, to get something because it, it just didn't register on them. And then because of the 
book you're reading or the science you're practicing or the music you're, you're, you're working with, suddenly it's alive for that. And for Emerson, that meant you are more alive too. You are more alive too. The desire to animate the world for Emerson was at the core of what a liberal education should be. The third moment that I want to spend a little bit more time on is um, uh, cooperate. Because uh, on the rubric of cooperation, uh, we have a group of thinkers who agreed in large part with Jefferson and Walker and Emerson. They agreed that education should make you freer, help you stand on your own two feet, make you self-reliant, open the world to experience. But they worried that the way we did education focused so much on the individual student and that the American cultivation of individualism is, as Dewey said, pathological. The rejection of interdependence as a form of uh, maturity is a disease, Dewey argued. But before I talk more about Dewey, I want to say a word about um, Jane Addams, who was denied the kind of college education you offer here and that, that we are so devoted to. Uh, Jane Addams wanted to go to Smith uh, in the late 1800s, and, uh, um, and uh, her father said, no. Uh, you're a girl, you, you know. Um, uh, and she, she, you know, Smith was only for women then. Uh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you don't read the New York Times magazine, okay? Um, so, um, so she didn't want. She wanted to go to. She wanted to go to Smith, and um, her father said, "No, you're going to go to a, a religious uh, school nearby." She goes there. She excels greatly. She, um, she's the editor of the paper. She's doing fantastically well. Um, and uh, she says, I want to go to Smith now. I've paid my dues. I show I can do it. And um, Daddy says, no, 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 you're, you're still a girl. Um, so you don't belong in school, a school like that. She wants to become a doctor. Uh, and then he died. And so here she could. She gets all the money. She can go to Smith. Now, I've spent most of my life studying Freud and Freudian things. So I wasn't surprised that, in fact, she decides, of course, I can't have to obey my father because the most powerful father is a dead father. Um, and and, uh, and uh, Jane Addams decides I shouldn't go because I'm a girl. So instead, she embarks on a kind of alternative education because she has all this money. She goes to Europe. She does the grand tour. She reads voraciously. She's uh, off the chart smart and open-hearted, open-minded, and, and taken in the world and has the money to do it. Um, in a capacious way, and then one day, one day she's 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 uh, in London. I think I have this right. She's in she's in uh, she's in she's in. I mean, I'm so used to talking to first year students. I can make things up all the time. Here I'm I'm, I'm a little very nervous talking to faculty. And it's like a, she's probably a Jane Adams biographer here somewhere. What the hell is he talking about? Anyway, sorry. That's what's so dangerous about the MOOCs I teach, because I always teach freshmen in, on campus, and I put up as a MOOC, and people with PhDs uh, with specializations in these areas. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> so Jane Adams, this is, uh, this is all going to come back together. Jane Adams is uh, uh, walking down the street in London, and she sees a guy get hit by a, a, a cab, a horse-drawn cab. He's knocked into the street. He's injured. So what does she do? She thinks of a poem by de, de Musset, who is citing a ver some, some passages from Homer about an accident and a person who fails to respond. So Jane Adams is standing there on the curb, seeing this suffering right in front of her. And then she goes through this circuit of, of learning. And she says, holy moly, or words to that effect, my education has destroyed my capacity for action in the world. I'm so smart, I can think of Demuse on Homer on um, tragedy, and I have not reached out to help this person who's been injured. I have, as she puts it so beautifully, lumbered my mind with literature. 
lumbered my mind with literature so that I'm un incapable of acting. Why don't we have an education that empowers us to act? Empowers us to act. And so she comes home from her touring and her education, and of course she opens a whole house, and she writes about the ways in which what we should do in education is not just empower people as individuals, but we should empower people as individuals in such a way that they see their connections to other people. She has a beautiful essay called The Modern Lear, where she talks about how we're so good at teaching people how to be critical. You know, even in the early 20th century, now we're really good at it. Like you probably have courses in advanced snarkiness, right? <laughs> Not in the business school. That would be in, that would be in communications, right? <laughs> Come on, work with me. Um, so, 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 uh, so Jane, Jane Adams realizes that we teach people how to see through arguments, you know, how to, how to uh, expose a, a speaker's uh, uh, fallacies, uh, bad arguments. Uh, but what we don't do enough, she says, is to teach people how to understand the arguments from the other person's point of view. How to put yourself in that person's position? This is right out of William James' essay uh, called uh, "Talks to Teachers," called "On a Certain Blindness in Human Beings." I'd love to talk about that, but I don't have time. But it's right out of James, and it's really connected to W. E. B. Du Bois, two other people I write about in the book, who see education as empowerment, but empowerment that includes the sympathetic function rather than the function of competitive advantage which we teach our students and we practice as institutions, right? I'm walking around the school saying, yeah, I wonder if I should do that at Wesleyan. Should I tell them about my new plan for revamping the curriculum or will they do it first? <laughs> Competitive advantage, it's an American disease too, especially when you're not very good at it. <laughs> Becomes a real disadvantage when all you do is talk about it. Um, uh, Instead, Adams, Du Bois, William James, this branch of pragmatism talked about empowerment as being perfectly in harmony with empathy, with cooperation, with paying attention to people who are suffering. How would it be if we in liberal education talked less about distribution of credits and more about whether our students can distribute their affections in ways that make them better neighbors, citizens, effective members of a community. Adams worried that as our education got more sophisticated, not only did we dry people up, as Emerson worried, but we kept them apart from each other. Smart people are very good at recognizing the reasons why they shouldn't do something. You have to go beyond that when liberal education is wedded to cooperation as it was by James, by Jane Addams, by W.B. Du Bois, by Dewey, who says um, in an essay called Problems uh, on Recovery of Philosophy, uh, Dewey says that philosophy will die and should die if it doesn't deal with the problems of human beings. I could quote him exactly, but Dewey was, um, well, I think it, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the, uh, God would speak in the language of John Dewey, which, you know, because Dewey was so smart, but, but if God were inarticulate. <laughs> <laughs> so Dewey, Dewey's a clumsy, a clumsy writer most of the time, not all the time. He wrote so much you can find a few pearls. Uh, but the basic point is, is so important that the empowerment that comes from studying philosophy or business or history or communications or technology or, uh, or foreign languages uh, or biology or physics, the empowerment that comes from that should be an empowerment that leads to cooperation and enhanced ability to deal with the real problems off campus beyond the university, not the problems of professors. We do have the illusion sometimes, we in the academy, that by teaching our own field, we are not being vocational in our instruction. By making believe the students in our classes are actually going to go on and become uh, advanced workers in our own field, that somehow we're not being vocational. We are being vocational, we're just being um, uh, unconsciously vocational and asking for imitators rather than for inquiry. 
what Dewey wanted us to do in our educational system, both in the K through 12 and, and university system, was to direct the wide-ranging, broadly conceptual and contextual approach that is liberal education to problems that are recognized as real off campus and not just the problems that are recognized by professors. My last moment is uh, instigate. And Dewey was certainly an instigator. You know, Dewey, uh, like many of us, uh, had to fight off those people who were looking at college education uh, as a pathway to uh, uh, a job. And so they wanted it to be as narrow as possible, as quick as possible, and so they can plug right into a job. And, and Dewey, Dewey had an a, a, a interesting perspective on this because Dewey thought education was all about creating habits of mind and action that would be tested in the world. He, 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 he really, you know, as a pragmatist, he was all about what you're going to do in the world that shows the value of your education. But Dewey thought, as Jefferson did, that it was an infringement on the freedom of the students to insist that they take a track to fit into a system that had already assigned them a place. And that, as he put it, he knows everyone needs a job in the industrial regime. He just doesn't love the regime enough to give them exactly the job training that the captains of industry in his day thought they needed. And I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think that's uh, any different. He said that in 1918. Um, I don't think that's any different if you say that you know the captains of industry come from uh, Silicon Valley, that so they value freedom. That's I think that's just nonsense. Uh, they value imitation. They they call entrepreneurship um, the creation of more people like themselves, um, and um, are, and devalue a broad education that would allow the challenge of the status quo. And the challenge of the status quo is what I mean by instigation. So we want our students to know enough by the time they get to college and university to rebel against what they've been taught, to rebel against you. They certainly rebel against the president. That's a given. Um, you don't have to be Freud to figure out why. Um, but instigating change is what we want our students to be more capable of when they graduate, when they go beyond the university. That is a hard thing to do in a time like our own when many students are m eager to conform. By the time we get them in colleges and universities, they have proven their worth by doing well on tests. The whole point of that is just figure out what the test taker wants to hear and tell her or him, including using her and him in that order, because that's what people want to hear. So to do that kind of thing, to conform to the ethos around you, is what we've drilled our students in. And I don't know how many of you get this. And I, I'm always shocked at Westing, because we have this reputation for radicalism, that you know, students will come up to you know, say, what's the prompt? And you're asking them to write a poem. You know, I, I, I say sexual arousal <laughs> is the prompt. And then they look at me and they, they start filling out a form. I don't actually say that. My, the lawyers at Wesleyan are like spinning around in their offices, not their grades. Um, but can you, uh, but our job in a climate where they are asking us for the tools to conform, and that happens a lot. I'm sh I know it happens a lot. I, I, um, uh, for you as it does for our, uh, folks uh, at Wesleyan, our job is to remind them of the pleasures of aversive thinking, to use Emerson's phrase, of the originality and the, the frisson, the, the, the beauty, the thrill of going against the grain. We have to sometimes dress that up and say that, and that will also help you get a job, and that will also help you do these things and impress people. That's true, and I do that. To, but to insist that liberal education is not a collection of disciplines, as it had been in Europe. Liberal education is a mode of thinking that inspires inquiry that is going to be liberating, 
animating, inspire cooperation, and if successful, incite our students to not just make our classrooms better, but to make the world of beyond the university a better place. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. I don't know. I'm not. Um, no, I know. I. I, I know. It's open. It was the, the, the hand that your hand went up first. I did. See, at least I saw it first. Okay. Testing. We saw you on a documentary done by CNN on re on crisis in higher ed that um, focused largely on Cooper Union trying to finish um, many years of history of a free education. And you were bravely there meeting parents, leaving oh, yes. their children <laughs> at Wesleyan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a father raised his hand and said, will my student have a job in four years? No, he, he what he said, thank you, you're, you're close. But what he said was, uh, I want to know, President Roth, if in four years my daughter will be coming home and living at home, or will she have a job? <laughs> and to your credit, you didn't really give a firm. Well, they cut out my no. answer. Oh, OK. So here's my question. They actually cut out my answer. <laughs> they, they kept part of it in. I'm, and and I'm, I apologize, because there's no way you could know that. Yeah. Uh, but my answer, which I thought was pretty funny at the time, was cause, <laughs> because his daughter was sitting right next to him, and she was mortified. And everybody left, and she went like this. So I said, there's no question she won't be coming home. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. And Andrew Rossi, humorless Andrew Rossi, who's, uh, you know, um, uh, no, nah, he's not humorless. But I thought, I, I was so sorry because I thought it was kind of funny. And, 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 I was, and then I gave my, my, my shtick, but uh, yes, yeah. my other shtick. Yeah. <laughs> this is my question. I'm sorry. What are you telling? <laughs> What are you telling parents? Our, we know our students yeah. are very close to their parents. They labor under their expectations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Education is so expensive. Um, yeah. How is this audience of parents and students hearing your message? Are you changing hearts and minds? W what is that going forward? That's a great question. The, 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 um, uh, I, I, do have, I do argue in, this, in, in the book and every time I meet with parents that this kind of education is creating more opportunity and deeper problem solvers than the one they think they, sh they need to get. And um, I, I do, I, the, 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 the last chapter of the, of the book, and if you get there, you get a prize. You, you get a, my brother sends you a flower. Um, uh, the last chapter of the book is about pragmatic liberal education. I really believe the pragmatic part is key. That's why I actually don't use the words liberal arts in the, very often in the book. Because liberal arts, they kind of connote that some things belong in and some things don't. I, I, I take the pragmatist view, you could teach anything for, with, a, for, with a, a liberal framework, by which I mean conceptual, contextual, and showing the interconnection between what you're studying and other things. That ability today is so prized by whether you want to go into not-for-profit work or you want to go into investment banking and consulting, the things that every all well, the freshmen say, I would never do that. And all the seniors say, yeah, I'll do that. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and they, they will be able to be more uh, resilient, creative, um, and uh, uh, insightful because of a broad in education. I don't think they should have this education so they can, uh, as, as Ben Franklin said about the Harvard students, they know how to walk out of a room backwards. Like, you know, That was the big thing you learned in Cambridge. Um, that's not worth saving. I think what's worth saving is a mode of education that empowers students to make a difference upon graduation. That means we have to give them the tools to translate the liberal education, whether they're English majors or chemistry majors or religion majors or communications majors, to translate that into what they're going to do after they graduate. That is different from when I was in school. I think the professors felt no such uh, uh, obligation. Uh, and, and of course, I, I was going on graduate school, so I, I, I was like, you know, fine, I, I, was, I was moving in that direction. But I think today, showing students how to translate from the study of poetry to other things is part of what we do. And when we do that, I, I, employers tell me all the time that they will have a great advantage in the marketplace. Cost is a huge issue. Um, and I, I think that 
Um, you know, one of the things driving uh, the sticker price of colleges up uh, I, uh, is, and I'm just stealing this from President uh, Catherine Hill at, at Vassar, is uh, more inequality in the country. As you have a group of super rich people who will pay whatever it takes to send their kids to school, schools will respond to that. The incentive is <laughs> build another building, put another facade on a building. What's the educational payoff? Nobody knows. What's the payoff with parents? I can measure that. Where's the development officer? She's probably busy. Um, so I, I think that um, um, figuring out how to offer a really great education much more efficiently is part of our obligation as faculty members, not just as a president. I teach a MOOC not because I'm president, but because I wanted to learn how to teach in a different format. So I've been doing the same thing so long. Uh, and I, MOOCs aren't the answer, but some version of those kinds of classes will be helpful to lots of people, not everyone in the future. So I think that a dealing with the cost issue is a, is a, is a major national uh, task. As President Wesleyan, I deal with that by trying to raise money for financial aid. And we've uh, pledged a few years ago now to, to keep our tuition increases to, to CPI. And we've done that. Uh, I was wrong, though. I thought all the other schools would, would say, oh, we're going to do that, too. And nobody else is doing it. So my tr board is saying, like, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, why don't you charge? People will pay just to have more financial aid. And that's the model, I think, that has put us in such difficulty. But it is definitely the strongest model out there right now. There was a hand back here first, yeah. Or what you started with, it's so hard not to think about what's going on at, and in France. And I think what, as I'm sure you recognize, what you were saying I think does directly speak to that. Um, you're, I think you're, I completely agree. Ideas don't have a, a great deal of importance in the abstract. It's how they apply to what's going on. I think the people doing these horrendous things are antithetical to what you're talking about. So I appreciate what you're saying about that. And I appreciate how you started. I also appreciate what you just said about, about tuition. I mean, something you hear from students all the time. And yeah. what you said, national problem is correct. Let's go up to my question. I'm curious, so you're a historian, so maybe you'd answer it from this perspective, and that's fine. But I'm curious, do you, are there examples right now of universities that you think are doing the things you're talking about well, or are there historical examples? I mean, your book pretty clearly seems to draw on some historical examples. Where there, and people tend to romanticize the past, so I don't want to do that. But were there times in the past when things were done better? Are there examples now that you think are good ones? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I don't think there is one answer to this. I mean, I, I think uh, the kind of students you get at American University and we get at Wesleyan and you get, and the, it will be different from the, uh, President Obama's plan announced yesterday or at least gesture at a plan uh, to have, you know, community colleges free for everybody. That's a, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, if, if we made a commitment to take 30% of our students from community colleges, that would be revolutionary. Don't hold your breath. And I haven't done it either. You know, we, we, we're taking a lot more, and we're, you know, we have a program. But I think expanding access in a, in the, in, is going to have an impact on how much we're willing to spend on individual students. It's a little different but than talking about cost. Let me say just another word about that. Um, the, the, uh, when I sit around with the, uh, uh, Co the Kofi schools, these very wealthy Ivy League schools and, and private liberal arts colleges and a few others, um, uh, they, they, they intend to spend more money per student. That's their model. And they're spending seventy-five dollars to uh, $95,000 per student. And they're very proud of it. They're, they speak more. Some of the schools still actually advertise after uh, alumni. Um, and the incentives are in place, the tax incentives and other things to do that. I, I think it's, it's an it's a, a awful thing. I think you can offer a first-rate education, not for $10,000, but for a lot less than, than $80,000. Um, and so um, uh, I think you do need policy changes to change incentives so that schools that have the capacity can experiment with more modestly uh, cost, more modestly priced, uh, options that still uh, uh, will be part of their identity. We'll still have the quality there they expect. So it's very different. I want to be careful. It's very different from the Texas. Uh, we can have a ten thousand dollar degree. Uh, you know, it's like we get into a ten thousand dollar helicopter built in Texas. I, I'm not. I'm not going to do it. So I mean, you get at some point you get what you pay for, but only at some point because after a certain point, the marginal utility of those extra dollars 
which we are paying for with subsidies to those schools, schools like mine, uh, uh, that, that, that's, I think, that should change. But the forces to change that are really strong. Sorry. Um, yes? Lucky you. <laughs> So I went to McGill. My tuition was $19 a credit. Yeah. Right now, I mean, the students rebelled uh, a year and a half ago, yep. two years ago, when the tuition increase was to go up to 3000 yep. from 1800 But again, the whole structure of publicly funded universities versus the United States, but there, the education system is not bad. It's very good. So yeah. the question is, does it mean the whole fabric of the country and society is different? Yes. Uh, you know, and it's Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, be, I mean in, in, the, in other words, the fact that they don't charge very much for credit doesn't tell you anything about how much it costs. It just, it just the cost is hidden, and it's borne by the taxpayers generally. Um, and so it doesn't mean, it, usually, it even the Canadian, it does allow more access, but even the Canadian government is not known for being extraordinarily efficient. Right? I mean, so in other words, if you wanted to have an efficient lower course system, uh, 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 system, uh, uh, it, gov governmental management may not be the best thing for the United States, which is a very different, as you know better than I, but a, a very different country than, than Canada. We won't have a single system. What I'm hoping for in the, you know, whatever, the, the, if this tape doesn't get around, I have a few more years as President Wesleyan. Um, what I'm hoping for, uh, what I'm hoping for is that uh, we can create different access paths for more students. You know, and, and we're a small place at Wesleyan, so we, we, can, we do small things. But it's very easy for people to save 20% off their tuition now at Wesleyan and graduate in three years. Um, I, I think in a few, we should plan to have some students will be there for two years. We should educate a lot more people, and we should, and, and, and we should have very high standards. But uh, you know, 30 weeks of vacation a year is not necessary, even if you call it an internship so they work for nothing for a, a company. Um, uh, I, I do think there are lots of ways to experiment, and faculty have to do this, because uh, experiment with other paths to learning the things we want our students to learn that don't fit into the standard semester, that don't cost the same amount, that give different paths for different kinds of students without sacrificing the kind of liberal education that I've tried to describe. Yes. working good yeah. could, could you just say a, a word or two about the possible and I think actual tension between an incentive structure especially for junior faculty that primarily prizes privileges and rewards publication in top tier high ah. impact factor nobody ever reads them except other specialists in the field journals you don't have a, you don't have a point of view about this no no not at all <laughs> And the kind of education that you're talking about, because ah, at the end yes. of the day, we are all human. We do have to make trade-offs in terms of our time. The kind of education that you're talking about, which I applaud both literally and figuratively, um, is something that requires quite a lot of time commitment yeah. on the part of very smart people who could otherwise be spending that time cracking that top tier journal with that publication that's going to give them the impact factor of eight zillion or whatever it happens to be. So can you just talk a little bit about yeah. maybe how you've thought about that and how you've managed some of that tension? Well, it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, because I, I, I didn't talk about the research dimension. Uh, I, I do think that um, universities is a, loca a locus for producing new knowledge uh, is absolutely critical for, to their function in this country. Um, I mean, it's very obvious uh, uh, in, in some fields, uh, um, in this, uh, you know, the, the STEM fields most uh, obviously, most glaringly, uh, but it's also obvious in, uh, in places in the arts where, w uh, if not for universities, certain modes of artistic practice would, would, would uh, probably disappear or at least really be hard pressed to operate at anything like the levels at which they operate. Um, that said, um, I, I do think the um, emphasis on uh, the conventional measures of impact um, should be rethought. And we have done this at Wesleyan. This is a faculty initiative, uh, which I very much support. Um, 
uh, that they're not what we, some people on the faculty call non-traditional scholarship. Um, I do think, um, uh, and this is more of a prejudice than an argument, I, 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 but I do think that being in a classroom with someone who's actively producing knowledge is unbelievably exciting. I mean, uh, I, I, it's not because they're in a top journal. Like when you're an undergrad, you know what the heck a top journal is. But when you're with a person who you, I mean, you feel that they are actually you know, um, pushing at some boundaries in their own thinking and not just explaining something to you, that's a different experience. If I want something explained to me, I can watch it on my iPad. But when, you know, it's like going to theater or going, when you're with someone who's actually thinking in a way that is expanding the boundaries of knowledge, whether, whatever it's about, I, I, I think that's about as exciting as it gets. You know, I'm a nerdy person, so that's how it excites me. <laughs> but, um, uh, and, and so I do think it, we, would be, we should not undermine the research function, but we should be less conventional about what, what, what counts as the research function. My great teacher at Westing was a man named Henry Abeloff, who was, um, oh, you know Henry? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, Henry Abeloff, who was, um, you know, he didn't finish his dissertation before he got tenure. He was, uh, I said, oh, you're a perfectionist. He said, no, I'm neurotic. Um, um, and, uh, and he went on to, uh, the dissertation became a wonderful book, and other, bro and, and other things followed. He didn't hit the conventional measures, but he became one of the founders of gay and lesbian studies. He, he was, uh, you know, and, and a miraculously gifted teacher. But I think as one of the things that made it so exciting to be in his class is that you knew that he was actively pushing at the borders of what we know. And it was like that with Natalie Davis in graduate school and others. So um, they don't have to, but it wasn't about the name of the journal. It was about the nature of their mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, who, who are, anyone, any, yes, right here. You are applauding, you get to ask a question. <laughs> so you set us on a path or a path for our students to be liberated, to be active, to be engaged, uh, to cooperate, and, and to instigate. Thank you. Two questions, what do we say to their first line supervisors and their employers about those acts of instigation? And then what do we say to them to prepare them for the strength of the powers that will question mm. their intentions, their motives, mm -hmm. um, and get them ready to really yeah, that's muscle great, up that's a great on question. those questions? That's a great question. That's, thank you very much. To, uh, I don't know if I have a great answer. It was such a good question. But um, you know, in France, they'd say, the, the response is in the question itself. <laughs> Kari told me to say that if I got in trouble. Um, so I, I hope you realize I'm doing my very poor imitation of the really radical humorists at, uh, at Charlie Hebdo. I, I'm not always trying to be this crass um, and funny. Um, um, uh, but I think part of the educational process is helping students understand the obstacles to what they want to do. And if you teach them that the, the, the way to deal with an obstacle is to whine, you know, as my daughter says, oh, you've just taught them that whining pays. You know, I don't want to take the test on Friday. I have to go to the doctor. And you say, okay, take it on Monday. And you've just taught them whining pays. You haven't taught them how to deal with an obstacle. If they want to change uh, pal uh, US policy in the Middle East and they occupy my office, it's not really going to help very much in the Middle East. So giving them the tools to deal with the, uh, the, the government, with the military, with the employers, tools, because if they just whine or run, ram the head into the wall, it's not gonna work. But that means giving students a dose of beyond the university while they're at the university. And that's that combination of wanting to both give them, as they always say, a safe place where they can, they can uh, try things out, but also giving them a sense that there are consequences when you try things out. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't work. And so, you know, Wesley, the average grade is like an A minus or something. And I have students come and say, well, yeah, <laughs> you gave me a C plus. And it's a film and philosophy course. It's not, it's not even STEM. <laughs> and and I, I, I say, well, congratulations. And I say, well, you say, I've never gotten a C plus. I say, well, congratulations. 
I say, and, and they often, often say, so what can I do about that? And I say, well, you can study for the next test. <laughs> and they're shocked. They've been, because many times they've been told that, uh, you know, and so I wanted to be nurturing. I want them to do the work. But I also want them to know sometimes it doesn't work. And it's hard to make change. So I had a uh, last, very quickly, I had a dance major in my office. He said, you know, it's really hard to get an internship when you're a dance major. And I, I said something like, no, <laughs> no, no, uh, no kidding. <laughs> he said, I, and you know, I, he, was, he was really angry. I said, get used to it. I mean, that's what you signed up for. So we can help you try to find things. But it's going to be a lot harder for you than if you were an economics major. But that's, but you get to dance. <laughs> you get to dance. So let's figure out. But to tell this guy, well, there won't be any difference between you and the guy majoring in um, data analysis, that's, that would be a disservice, I can tell you. Yes? Can you hear me? Um, yes. So I want to thank you because you got me all fired up about liberal education again. Um, but you know, I grew up undocumented and most of my life. And so uh, I, what I wanted to ask you is a two-part question. I'm a journalist, so I have to do two-part questions. Um, so the first question is, you know, you speak a lot about how to make various paths available. And so like, my question is, how do you make various paths um, in these like alternate paths known, available, and accessible to immigrant children, undocumented children, and uh, in the just kind of like a longer kind of term strategy, like people of color? Um, and then the second part to this is like, my, my mom still doesn't get what I do. Like I try to explain to her the value of like why liberal education is important. She's like, she's not even like first gen. You know, she, she values like being a lawyer, being a doctor. She's like, you know, we immigrated when we were very young. So like, how do you also uh, work with parents to get them to understand the importance of a liberal education, especially when they're coming from immigrant backgrounds? I said those are both uh, so important. Uh, so on the first question, uh, I think that um, you know the short-term answer is allocate money to financial aid and um, communicate broadly to areas of the country, uh, at least, uh, where people don't know that, um, let's say in my case, that Wesleyan could be free for them um, and um, and offer an, an exciting opportunity for them. So. So um, that's, 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 you know, we're a small place. It's, we only it's, it's not, it's not going to be a lot of, of people. Um, and that range, that, and that, that, like for us, that goes from partnering with, you know, we ha we've had more prep for prep students at Wesleyan, I think, than any school in the country over the course of uh, that organization's existence. And in, in the top two or th I think, in, in a better chance students. We just partnered with Questbridge, which you, you may do as well. It's been really a great thing for us because we also not just get students from underrepresented groups. We get students from different parts of the country who had never heard of us before and who bring to our campus a different cultural experience that um, makes it sometimes hard for them because, because of this uh, everything we take for granted. So many things we take for granted for them, it's, it's a chore. It's a, something to wrestle with. And so we have to be. You know, and I, I have to, I, I've erred in that regard. I actually thought, we open the doors, we get people to come, we make it really accessible, free, let's say, um, and we're done. No, because then we have, all, we have lots of issues with students on campus um, because of radical inequality in America. Um, the campus is not the bubble it was before. Rich people like to show how rich they are now, they, they, and we have a lot of them, too. Where, you know, whereas when I was a student, the rich people like couldn't tell because they were always dressing down, um, and um, uh, that's not so much the case anymore. So I think ma accessibility and support is is, uh, is, is, is uh, and allocating money to financial aid. Your administration, like mine, makes decisions all the time. You can increase your you know, spending in in various areas, or you can increase your discount. And it's a choice. And you have uh, a role as faculty members. Uh, you may not want it <laughs> because it's, it's also one of those areas is compensation. But you either, you, you allocate. So on the, on the broader issue of, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been the case for a long time that first generation students have a heck of a hard time explaining to their parents what they've done, my, my father's a furrier, didn't go to college, didn't graduate from high school except by joining the Navy. 
Um, and when my major at Wesleyan was the history of psychological theory, uh, otherwise known as procrastination. Um, <laughs> I, couldn't de I couldn't decide. So, um, and, and there were stories like that to go back 50, 75, 100 years, you know, that people, if you're doing a job as an educational institution, you're, you're offering people a chance to do something that their parents don't understand. And our job as teachers and as administrators is to tell the parents, gosh, thank you. You are giving your children a chance to do things you don't understand. And if you're not, then you're actually that's just a failure. And that can be in technology, it could be in communications, it could be in just being in a liberal education environment. Um, and I, I think it's, it's not as easy as I described, of course. Um, but but I, I do think um, sharing the message about the pragmatic value um, um, and, the, um, and the, the joys of that experience, of having a broader experience, I guess that's the best I can do for you. One more question. There's a, yes, in the corner there. It's very interesting, and I agree with most of the things you said. Um, I wanted you to comment on what I've observed as somewhat of a troubling trend. Um, I've noticed as the parent of an elementary school child that there seems to be an emphasis on teaching, quote, critical thinking skills at levels where it's inappropriate. In other words, kindergarten, <laughs> first grade, et cetera. And um, <laughs> by, the time <laughs> by the time they get to college, it becomes a vocational school. So at the university level, everyone's focused on, well, do they have the skill set to get a job and do we have employers who are going to do this, which obviously is important. But I see the long-term effect of that as being a major skills gap where they're not learning the basis, yeah. the basic things in kindergarten and uh, elementary school, and they're learning things that they should be learning in college, whereas college has now become a trade school. So I'd love to get your um, feeling on that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a piece in the book that uh, actually was in the, uh, in, the, in the New York Times called Young Minds in Critical Condition, I think was the, t the title that the New York Times gave the the uh, op-ed piece, uh, where I, I actually, um, I, I, I question the value of critical thinking. And, you know, that, that, and I think there's a, there was a session, or there's about to be a session uh, about critical thinking in, in your conference. Um, uh, and I, um, I, I do think that, um, um, the, the, um, and I, wanna say f I don't want to say fetishization, but the word that occurs to me of critical thinking um, uh, at the expense of learning things that you can work with and not just be critical of uh, is a d real disservice, especially to our youngest students. I, I, I find that uh, our students know they're supposed to be critical um, and they know that a sign of intelligence is to, is to be able to not be taken in by something else, uh, to be able to see through something, uh, to be not fooled. And I, I think this is a, a great hindrance, actually, and that, that we also have to give our students the capacity to be absorbed in something, to fall in love with things, to open their hearts to things. Um, and finding the balance between cr the critical and the absorptive is, is I, I think, uh, a really important task. And I'm thinking maybe that's what my, I'm going to write my next book about. Um, but in those early years, I do think um, giving the students the uh, um, the, the fodder, the material, the lumber that they will then be able to use to build or to reshape. To ask them to reshape things before they have anything to reshape seems to me um, uh, suspect, although I'm, I've, I'm not a, a, a teacher of elementary school. But I have kids, so I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think, we, hold still everyone, please. I think we have our work cut out for us, but it's gonna be an exciting road ahead. The next session is gonna begin at 2.30, so you will have about 15 minutes of break, but some really important announcements first. If you did not pick up your name tag, there are two vital reasons why you should. The first is so we know you are here, because we're all bean counters, right? But much more importantly, you cannot be rent entered into the raffle unless you have picked up your name tag. So there's some good things that we have on offer for free, um, some of the best things in life. 
Uh, so please go to the registration table. Let us know for sure you are actually here. The dessert reception and raffle begin here at 445. In addition to some really nice food, and there'll be some music, you will also have the opportunity to get up close and personal with President Roth's book, which will be on display. I'll be here. <laughs> and, 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 and he may even sign. Now, I must tell you, having had the joy of listening to President Roth um, for this last almost hour, I was reminded of an experience I had many years ago when I saw a movie. And the movie was the earlier Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. I grew up in the Washington area, and it was being shown on a movie theater, one of these really elaborate places. I want to say it was on 14th Street, pretty near the White House. And I remember coming out of the movie theater. It was late at night. It was a long movie. And just to one side, I want to say it was to the left, but it could have been to the right, there was a bookstore. There was a religious bookstore. And there was a sign that said, you've seen the movie, now read the book. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing all of you at various sessions this afternoon, after you've picked up your name tag, if you didn't already, and then for some real celebration and um, sharing and signing and conversation uh, at the end of the day. Thank you all.